What if I told you that Marco Polo traveled to a town in southwest China that hunted dinosaurs? I would say he definitely helped hunt dinosaurs. I would say Marco Polo's description was close enough to an alligator. My name's Matt, and I'm a novelist. And I'm Brian. I'm a designer and illustrator. We team up to create books about dinosaurs, the ancient world, and mysteries. We love this stuff. But we don't always agree. We are... Let's start in the year 1271. Niccolo Polo and his brother, Maffeo, returned to their home city of Venice after 15 years traveling and trading throughout Asia. They returned to Venice as wealthy men, and Niccolo met his 15-year-old son for the first time. That son's name? Marco Polo. Marco, his father, and his uncle seem to have quickly made up for lost time, because a couple years later, they set off on another trading expedition to the far eastern reaches of the world. The journey from Venice to China was dangerous and eventful. It took over three years. But eventually, the Polos reached the court of the great Kublai Khan, legendary emperor of China and grandson of Genghis Khan. The great Khan was quickly impressed with Marco Polo, admiring the young man's intelligence and humility. So he made Marco a diplomat in his imperial court. Now, this position had lots of advantages. Marco traveled all across Asia on diplomatic missions for Kublai Khan. He observed distant lands and people that folks in his native Venice could never have imagined. But there was also a big disadvantage. Kublai Khan didn't want Marco to leave his court. So Marco ended up staying at the imperial court for 17 years before Kublai Khan finally let him return home. By the time Marco Polo made it back to Venice, he had been gone 24 years. And while Marco was traveling the world, a political war had broken out back at home. Marco soon threw his support behind, well, the wrong faction and promptly got thrown into prison. While in jail, Polo met a fellow prisoner named Rusticello da Pisa. Rusticello was a writer of Arthurian romances. Presumably, with no other way to pass the time, Marco started telling Rusticello all about his travels throughout the Eastern world. Rusticello wrote it down. The result is a book that we know in English as The Travels of Marco Polo. Now, don't worry about Marco. He got out of prison a couple years later. He became a wealthy merchant in Venice, got married, had a family, the whole thing. But his real legacy was the travels of Marco Polo. Even during his lifetime, in an era before the printing press, it became a sensation throughout Europe. It was translated into numerous languages and sparked fascination and intrigue across the continent. Polo's account of his many adventures traveling to the to Europe at least, blank sections of the map, and his keen observations on the different people he encountered there is a foundational tool for historians looking for a snapshot of life in those regions at that time. Or is it? From the beginning, people had questions about Polo's crazy stories, which again were told decades after the fact. Many of his contemporaries viewed it as essentially a collection of tall tales, more designed to entertain than to educate. I mean, they're written down by a romance writer for crying out loud. And there are passages, uh, encounters with robbers and meetings with rulers, that definitely have the feel of being written by a romance writer. There are other passages that are simply exaggerated. At one point, Polo claims that Hangzhou had an astronomical 12,000 bridges in the city. The actual number was around 350. Polo also claimed that Kublai Khan had 100,000 horses, a number that's just about physically impossible to feed. Other accounts are pretty obviously fabricated. For instance, Polo claims that he was once on an island in the Bay of Bengal where, quote, all the men 
have the crown of the head like a dog and teeth and eyes like dogs, end quote. Some, like historian Francis Wood, have even suggested that the whole work is a fabrication. I mean, think about it. All we really know about this Marco Polo guy is that he left Venice as a teenager and came back as some middle-aged rich guy. How can we be sure he even made it to China? He supposedly spent 17 years there, but never mentioned the Great Wall of China or chopsticks. He seemed to get various geographical and cultural facts wrong. Did Marco see any of this, or was he just passing along the stories he'd heard from other travelers? On the whole, however, most contemporary historians think that Polo's account is broadly reliable. Those geographic and cultural facts that he supposedly got wrong? Well, later information that we've learned has generally supported Marco's story and shown that our conventional wisdom is what was incorrect. And things like the Great Wall and Chopsticks? Again, Later information has shown it was reasonable for someone in Marco's position to not think to mention them. Historian Mark Elvin summarized what appears to be the academic consensus on Marco Polo. He says that more recently discovered evidence, quote, demonstrates by specific example the ultimately overwhelming probability of the broad authenticity, end quote, of Marco Polo. Uh, Elvin goes on to say that the travels of Marco Polo is, quote, in essence, authentic, and when used with care, in broad terms, can be trusted as a serious, though obviously not always final, witness, end quote. Okay, with all of that in mind, let's get to the dinosaurs. The main passage comes from chapter 49 of The Travels. Now, this occurred during the time when Polo was doing different diplomatic missions for Kublai Khan. One of his journeys took him to the Karajang region, which is in the modern-day province of Yunnan in southwest China. While he was there, he observed a creature which the locals thought of as a part of everyday life. But we would find this creature a little more extraordinary. Brian, can you read the relevant part of chapter 49 where they talk about the dragons? Sure thing, Matt. Here we go. Leaving the city of Yachi and traveling 10 days into the westerly direction, you reach the province of Karazan, which is also the name of its chief city. Here are seen huge serpents, 10 paces in length and 10 spans in the girth of its body. At the forepart near the head, they have two short legs, having three claws like those of a tiger, with eyes larger than a four-penny loaf and very glaring. The jaws are wide enough to swallow a man, the teeth are large and sharp, and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any animal can approach them without terror. Others are met with a smaller size, being eight, six, or five paces long. And the following method is used for taking them. In the daytime, by reason of the great heat, they lurk in caverns, from whence at night they issue to seek their food in whatever beast they meet and can lay hold of. Whether tiger, wolf, or any other, they devour, after which they drag themselves towards some lake, spring of water, or river in order to drink. By their motion, in this way along the shore, in their vast weight, they make a deep impression, as if a heavy beam has been drawn along the sand. Those whose employment it is to hunt them observe the track by which they are most frequently accustomed to go, and fix into the ground several pieces of wood, armed with sharp iron spikes, for which they cover the sand in such a manner as not to be perceptible. When therefore the animal make their way toward the place they usually haunt, they are wounded by these instruments and speedily killed. The crows, as soon as they perceive them to be dead, set up their scream, and this serves as a signal to the hunters, who advance to the spot and proceed to separate the skin from the flesh, taking care immediately to secure the gall, which is most highly esteemed in medicine. The flesh of the animal is also sold at a deer rate, being thought to be a high flavor than other kinds of meat, and by all persons it is esteemed a delicacy. 
All right, Bryce. So what do you make of this uh, serpent in southwest China? It is a fascinating story, Matthew. One that I think could have its grounding in reality. And what is that reality? Let me tell you, Matthew. Just to start with some brief foundations on the history of dragons in China and just some of the historical facts that lead us to think that maybe these were real creatures, right? And not just um, like alligators like you had mentioned or just something made up by Marco Polo himself. All right. So just a few examples here. And again, I think some of these could be episodes all on their own. So I will just kind of give quick one or two sentence overviews here. But first off, there is an emperor in China who had appointed a post as the royal dragon feeder. So, And some books even tell of the Chinese families raising dragons for the medicinal purposes that were mentioned in Marco Polo's section of that chapter. Another one, this book called The Zeus Han, uh, tells the narrative of how ancients raised dragons and how the state used the services of two clans that were known as dragon rearers and dragon trainers. And there's also historical records that tell of the Song Dynasty, where there was a rep- an emperor who raised dragons within the palace compound. There's also Hong Di, who is the mythic Yellow Emperor, and he is said to have driven a chariot harnessed by six dragons up to the top of a mountain to, um, to make sacrifices up there. But again, dragon power, pretty cool. Um, also in the Ming Dynasty, there is a landscape painter called Wu Bin, who actually has a painting of said emperor. I don't know if it's the same emperor, but there is an emperor who is driving a chariot driven by dragons. There are there is some speculation that maybe he was depicting a legend, but a lot of people are like, hey, he is depicting what has been said in these historical documents. And all these are coming from historical documents from China, just FYI. One specific, it's called the Biographies of the Immortals. This is the oldest surviving Chinese hagiography. All right, and it's, Wister- and it's written during the Western Han Dynasty, and it records ancient people, again, raising and rearing dragons. And they, this one actually says that they rode dragons, too. So, Matt, maybe some inspiration <laughs> for, me, so, for you. <laughs> sounds right up our lane, Brian. Sure does. Um, And last one I'm going to be mentioning here. So a historian from the Five Dynasties recorded an incident where a large dragon was found dead with a large injury into its throat. Again, this author seems that it had to be, or it seems that it was a living specimen, not just like fossils or anything like that, but a live specimen of a large dragon that was found with injuries to its throat. So again, all these being said, it seems like there's a pretty solid foundation of dragons not only being a part of Chinese culture in a like a mythology like a mythological way. Um, obviously, we've all seen the pictures of you know Chinese art depicting dragons, but it seems like there is historical proof that dragons were physically playing a role within their their culture. And as you mentioned too, like a lot of ancient medicinal recipes call for like dragon blood, dragon bones, different parts of dragons, right? It's very interesting there. Um, and again, calling for dragon blood would indicate that they're not just finding like, finding like fossils of large animals that they're calling dragons too. Because that's one of the theories out there that they're calling these dragon bones. They just find large bones, call them dragons, not really knowing what they are, right? But calling for dragon blood too means that they had to have living creatures. Any questions on that before I move on to my next point? Yeah, I do. And you are right that a lot of these uh, will probably be future episodes. Uh, The Chinese dragons are just a fertile source of uh, discussion for us. There's lots of really, really cool stories. (laughs) (laughs) But to your broader point, you're saying that this account from Marco Polo isn't in isolation. It's in the backdrop of a culture that talks a lot about dragons and sometimes talks about them in a way that sounds an awful lot like real animals. Yeah, absolutely. So as from the description from Marco Polo, you hear kind of a a lot of 
things that point to like, hey, that's a dragon. One odd thing that stands out that really stood out to me was that the dragon only had two legs, which I'm like, that's really weird. Why would it only have two legs? <laughs> or because usually when you see pictures of dragons, especially in Chinese art, they usually have four legs or no legs. I really, I scanned to see if I was like, is there any other dragons with two legs? And it turns out there are within cultures throughout the world. One of the most famous ones is called the the wyvern. Give me if I'm saying that wrong. But that one is distinct in the in England, Scottish, and Irish heraldry, which Matt, I'm sure you've heard of this one since you're very oh, into Oh, I have. Uh, I wrote a story. Right? Ab- I actually wrote a story about them, wyverns. Wyverns. That's that's what I meant to say. Um yeah, so they like I said, they're very prevalent in that region of the world, but they have two legs. They have wings as well, which obviously didn't come up in the Marco Polo story. But just to kind of give some precedence that there is still kind of like what I talk about, there is that thread throughout different cultures of similar creatures, snake-like, two legs, dragon. So honestly, the one thing where I'm like, it's a little bit odd that they have two legs. If I'm being completely honest with you. Any questions on that before I move to my next point? So what is your explanation for this dragon only having two legs? Do you think it was an actual species that only had two legs? Or do you think that, for whatever reason, uh, Marco Polo miscounts the number of limbs it had? Yeah, I have a few thoughts on this. So number one, obviously it could have been a real creature that only had two legs. That's kind of why I brought up the wyvern, just to kind of show that there is some credibility of different regions of the world having similar dragon with two legs. So uh, yes, there could have been a dragon with two legs. First option. Second option, he could have heard stories of these creatures, and maybe there was just some kind of mix-up on just like translation, that kind of thing. When So when he was he might not have seen the the creature, but maybe he was hearing stories. So then there's just some kind of miscommunication or something, you know, where maybe it had no legs, maybe it was more serpent-like, maybe it had four legs, something like that. Maybe, but like what comes to mind when I think of like something huge and terrifying with two legs and tiny little arms is like a T-Rex of some kind, right? Where maybe he didn't actually see it again. But when they're again, they're describing this creature, they leave out the arms because who cares about a T Rex's arms, right? <laughs> but you describe the, the legs. Um, so, another possibility there. But that one, I haven't really, that was just kind of for me. So, so do, you have, do you have any theories about what particular kind of dinosaur this could have been? One possible dino I've seen come up that is a good candidate for a lot of Chinese dragon mythology is called the Dinocephalosaurus Orientalis. So I'm probably saying it totally wrong. <laughs> but I'll send you pictures of it. <laughs> you can show it. So then people will be like, oh, that's the dinosaur he was talking about. The best way to describe it, it looks kind of like a plesiosaur, but with little arms. It's very long, kind of serpent-like, long neck. But it's not huge like a sauropod. It's not that big. But it looks kind of like a mini one, but a lot skinnier. But really long neck, really long tail, a long, thin body, short little arms. Very similar to what you might see as a Chinese dragon. There's even been some fossils where it kind of looks like it has like the like whiskers that are coming off that you see a lot in Chinese myth- like uh, dragon art. So that's one candidate for it. And again, those have four legs. So that's where, again, I'm like, maybe there was some kind of mistranslation. Another interesting thing about those, those don't get like huge, huge. Um, I think they grow to like maybe like eight to 10 feet from like head to tail. So they're not like gigantic, but they're still pretty big, bigger than like a human. That's one possibility. Um, One thing that doesn't really fit with this story in particular is the the mouth, like being able to swallow up a human. That's where that theory of mine, just like, hey, maybe it was like a T-Rex or something in that kind of genre. So I'm like, those are more of those like terrifying 
eat a person in one bite type of creatures that maybe again not really going to mention the arms or the legs something kind of mistranslated and like how they're describing the legs but that's kind of the creature that maybe could be playing into that as well there you go uh, all right any any other thoughts you wanted to add yes a few more thoughts here going into the chinese zodiac signs so as of right now as we're recording this we are currently in the year of the dragon so super cool there fitting but this is kind of similar to what we talked about in some of the babylonian episodes um where there's depictions of dragons and all the other depictions of animals are all real creatures that we all agree on are real creatures right but then there's a dragon in there so very similar with the chinese zodiac sign so there's the rat the ox the rabbit the dragon, the snake, the horse, the goat, the monkey, the rooster, the dog, and the pig. So what do all of those except one have in common, Matt? All the rest are real animals? Yeah. So you would think it would make sense that the dragon, too, would have been a real animal. Again, it seems kind of odd that you just have one mythological creature linked in there. And again, as I've said in those historical documents, it seems like dragons played an integral role in Chinese society throughout history, throughout multiple dynasties, all that stuff where they're training dragons, they're raising them for medicinal purposes. Dragons are an integral part of Chinese society. Hence why it's included with those real animals, because it was a real animal. And then lastly, I wanted to bring up, because I'm sure you're going to be touching on this, the alligators versus the dragons. Yes. <laughs> Obviously, when you hear this description, when you're coming from a point of like, obviously dragons aren't real, most similar creature are the alligators, right? That's where my mind went too. I was like, it sounds kind of like an alligator. But some things with the Chinese alligator specifically, they don't get as big and terrifying as like American alligators or anywhere close to as big as like crocodiles. Um, typically the Chinese alligators in this area grow to more like five feet. That's kind of an average size. The biggest one that has been measured was seven feet. So again, like that's not a huge alligator by the standards that we're used to seeing a big alligator or crocodile even. And when, again, when, these creatures are being described to Marco Polo. This was like a huge, intimidating creature that would eat tigers, eat deer. And I don't think a five-foot alligator is going to be hunting tigers. Obviously, a large saltwater crocodile, yes, those will hunt tigers and lions. <laughs> I don't think a five-foot alligator will take on a tiger. Yeah, and... Uh... That was something I was thinking quite a bit about, Brian. So uh, I, I will be addressing that directly soon. Yeah. But um, I think there's holes uh, in both of our stories. Here. <laughs> well, I, actually, another point in your favor is the overall tone of this passage. You know, I mentioned earlier that some passages of Marco Polo's uh, travels are pretty fanciful. They kind of have this romantic flourish. This passage doesn't seem like one of them, right? It, it seems pretty level-headed seems very factual based it, it seems to be telling a very sober account of a real life creature like yeah. so if there are romantic flourishes th this doesn't seem to be one of them yeah and even like just the way he's describing the hunters killing the animal like it's that's not like a type of thing that you would really go into like a detail like that when you're when you're telling a a fanciful <laughs> story that you dig the posts the spikes bury them in the sand because that's how they slide in so it's all like makes sense right how like yeah how it would work exactly it sounds like uh he's trying to tell a serious factual based account for how real people captured a real animal mm -hmm. yeah Absolutely. all right any anything else you wanted any any other uh, shots you were going to fire at the chinese alligator it's different from a dragon people okay <laughs> 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 I've never seen a an alligator pulling a chariot. <laughs> well, that's actually cool, uh, 
That's actually another question I had for you. So we have this account, which comes from like Southwest China. Then we have other accounts that seem to be, you know, more around the the, cap, the main imperial capitals of, of yep. ancient China. Do you think these are the same animals, like the same dinosaur species? Or do you think like one of them's in Southwest China, then a different species altogether is pulling the chariots? What What's your thought there? I would say there's probably a few different types of dragons. Yeah, it seems like there would have to be a few different types because there are a few different types of dragons depicted too. It seems like they're doing different jobs too If when they were rearing them. And like that one I mentioned at the beginning that is a lot smaller. I'm like, that would obviously be one that would be easier to raise for the medicinal purposes. But I don't know if it's big enough to like pull chariots and that kind of stuff. I would assume there's a few different types. Okay. Okay. I like it. Yeah. Uh, anything else you, you wanted to add? Um, I'm excited to do like a hundred more episodes on Chinese dragons. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I started researching this like, Oh, this keeps getting better oh, and better. Too. I was just like, <laughs> I was like every sentence I'm reading is a different episode. <laughs> so good stuff. All right. So Brian, like you mentioned, I now want to argue that most likely the creature mentioned in chapter 49 of the travels of Marco Polo was based on a Chinese alligator. Uh, to, to open my defense, I'm going to open in the same way that our cousin slash honorary uh, Melama brother uh, Drew did during our episode on the Beast of Jovandon. The Beast of Jovandon. Jovandon. I kept mispronouncing it during the episode. Here's the ancient Greek historian Herodotus describing a hippo based on his own firsthand account. Quote, this animal has four legs, cloven hooves like an ox, a snub nose, a horse's mane and tail, conspicuous tusks, a voice like a horse's neigh, and is about the size of a very large ox, end quote. As a reminder, we know that Herodotus actually visited Egypt, which means he probably would have seen hippos in real life. But that description he just gave, you know, about like a horse's mane and a snub nose is wrong. So it's possible for writers to observe an animal and then, you know, years after the fact, describe the animal and get some stuff wrong. So that that's just sort of stuff that that we can see. I think we're at a very similar position here with Marco Polo in the Chinese alligator. But before I get into the reasons why, I, I want to again emphasize the general consensus on Marco Polo's accuracy in his descriptions. Polo is viewed as generally reliable, but prone to exaggerations and inaccuracies. And remember, he was also describing this creature years, maybe decades after he saw it, so his memory may have faded. All right, so with those caveats in mind, I actually think the Chinese alligator works pretty well. Uh, let's walk through the different parts of the passage. Uh, first, going to some of the things you said, Brian, uh, looking at the things that he seems to have gotten wrong. Uh, first off, the legs. It appears that Marco is describing a creature that only has two legs. Uh, I'll add sort of an aside that from my reading of the text, I don't think his description requires two legs. It, it could be that he's only describing the front two legs, but staying silent on the issue of whether he has back two legs. That could just be me. I may not have a leg to stand on there. A leg to stand on there. <laughs> I like it. I'll take it too. <laughs> <laughs> but that was just a thought I had reading it. But let's assume that Polo is clearly referring to a creature that only has two legs. I'll admit that is weird. And that's incorrect as anyone who's ever seen an alligator can say. But Polo is right in pointing out that the creature does at least have claws on its forelegs, which Chinese alligators do. And depending on how the alligator's floating in the water, that might be the only legs that you're able to see of the creature. Also, Polo gets the number of claws wrong. He says that the creature has three claws on its, on its feet when alligators actually have five claws on the front feet, and four on the back. Now, I'll admit, that part doesn't concern me a whole lot. He may have just miscounted the claws or, you know, 10 years after the fact, misremembered how many claws are on there. But, but it is another inaccuracy. And finally, 
the overall length of the creature is wrong. Uh, like you pointed out, Brian, Chinese alligators are usually around five feet and seem to top out at about seven feet. Polo's description suggests that this creature was larger. For me, though, I, I think this is something we could explain as an exaggeration. Polo is, you know, simply exaggerating the size of an already large creature to make it even larger and even more scarier. So to me, that's an inaccuracy that we can't explain. But now let's get to the aspects of the description that do fit. Because I think if you go into this passage thinking alligator in your head, it actually makes a lot of sense and it fits pretty well. First of all, it's large size. Again, not quite as large as it was described, but Chinese alligators can get up to seven feet. That's very long. That's very big. And if you saw it in the water, you'd find it pretty terrifying. Also, it says that it had jaws that could swallow a man. Again, this is a bit of an exaggeration. I don't think you'd see a five-foot alligator and think it could swallow you whole. But alligators do have giant heads with really big mouths. And they really can swallow pretty big things whole, even if they're only five to seven feet. Another accuracy here is that they're nocturnal. Polo says that these beasts come out at night, and that's generally what Chinese alligators do as well. They're more active at night. Also, Polo says that these beasts live in caverns near the water. That's precisely what Chinese alligators do. They'll dig out some caverns and places to live very close by the water. Also, keep in mind how the people of that region hunted this animal. They put like sharp posts right underneath the sand, knowing that the creature would sort of crawl very close above the sand and impale itself. Again, just look at an alligator walking. They're very low slung, a very short distance above the ground. So that's how they would walk. And also, when alligators are around riverbanks, they will slide. So that would not only create the sort of big ruts in the sand that the passage describes, it would also mean that they'd be very vulnerable to precisely that hunting technique that Polo mentions. And finally, we mentioned that uh, the locals there would use the alligator for medicinal purposes and that they would eat the meat and consider it a delicacy. Brian, have you ever tried alligator? I have. It's very good. It's good, right? It so good. again, that part fits. So once again, I, I am not disputing with you that there are things about this passage that do not fit the Chinese alligator. I do think there are things that Marco Polo got wrong. I think there are inaccuracies. Maybe it's because his memory faded. Maybe he was embellishing to make the story better. Maybe there's uh, some other reason entirely. It doesn't fit perfectly, but in the broader picture of Marco Polo's travels, again, historians view him as broadly reliable, but sometimes prone to exaggerations. I think that fits pretty perfectly with the Chinese alligator. You could read this as a description of a Chinese alligator that's generally reliable with a few exaggerations and inaccuracies. All right. H have at it. What, what, what do you disagree with there? <laughs> Honestly, this is one where when I was reading through this, I kept thinking, <laughs> this sounds like an alligator. <laughs> so, so, it sounds so, I, like, so it sounds like this is one where you do not... You're not going to like plant your flag in the ground for this particular passage, chapter 49 of Marco Polo, but you will do that for some other Chinese dragon stuff later on. Is, is that yes, right? That's right. Okay. Do I think that dragons were real in China? Yes. Do I think this particular passage could very likely be talking about an alligator? Yes. Okay. It might, so, it's, yeah. so it sounds like I won the battle, but you still think you can win the war. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some there are some things with this though that I do still have some questions on. Wouldn't have people known what like a crocodile is, like a Nile crocodile in that region? Because I feel like people were kind of well traveled in like the Mediterranean where they would have encountered Nile crocodiles. So if he was seeing an alligator, it just seems a little odd to me that he wouldn't describe it as a creature that they know. So that's where Two things with that. I'm like, he could just be, like you're saying, playing it up, exaggerating it to making it sound a little bit more exciting. But it seems interesting he described it more serpent-like rather than like, it's like a crocodile that all of you kind of know what it is or a lot of you have 
possibly seen. Does that make sense? No, that does make sense. I, I don't know if Polo ever went to Egypt. I don't think he did, but you're right that Egypt would have had crocodiles in the Nile at that point. I don't know if any other areas that he traveled to had alligators or crocodiles, but you'd think they would. Um, like, like he was in India. Yeah, I think India has big crocodiles. Yeah. No, that that's a fair point. So I, I think that is probably a good point against my argument uh, mm-hmm. that he would have been familiar with creatures a lot like this. Yeah, that was kind of the one thing that I was thinking, like, maybe some pushback there. But mm-hmm. again, it's like you said, I think Marco Polo was prone to some exaggeration. <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, I'm like, I, I, I love don't... his story. Like, and then I went to the court of the great Kublai Khan, and he said, "Marco, you're super smart, and I like you. Come join my court." It's like, yeah, Marco, I'm sure it went exactly like Done. that. Yeah. Done. <laughs> and that is our show for today. Thank you again for watching. Uh, once again, we are a new channel, so we super appreciate any subscribes, any likes, any comments that you can leave. And if you want to watch a past episode that we did where we're also talking about maybe killing a dragon in antiquity, uh, please check out the episode we did on a, a dragon in the book of Daniel that the prophet Daniel kills. What? Let me also say that I had been the one in charge of responding to comments, and I'm very bad at it, but Brian has taken over the duties as the official comment responder. So if you comment now, you will probably get a response from Brian. It's going to be fun. I love reading all the the comments that are especially mean to us. I love those. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) So, yes, please comment. Please nice things. But uh, either way, comment, like, subscribe. Thank you again. Bye.